quite a while. Um, and we've talked about some ways for me to get involved at the center. Um, so I just feel really honored and thrilled to be part of this show. Um, and to have Don Miller in the audience, who was a professor at RISD when I was there, and really walked me through finding my aesthetic in wood. So the ways that I like to make, the visual aesthetic that I like to make, and providing kind of guidance on the processes that can produce those things. So thanks, Don, for coming. Um, so uh, I just want to um, give a little context to the work that we have in the show. Um, so I'm a wood-based artist primarily, but I also work in community. Y'all in the back can feel free to come and listen. <laughs> Um, so these are wooden forms out of cedar um, and vessels that all kind of nest together. Um, I also work in community a lot. And so the conversation today, been to, I invited Bintu to participate, thinking um, not just about the physical object, but how vessels show up in our lives. Um, and I'm excited that you're here. <laughs> um, so just to give the context to this, I was invited to participate in the Designing Motherhood exhibit, um, and I believe that was in 2021, 2021 that it opened here in Philly. Um, and so around the corner here, there's a video installation from one of the pieces that was in that show. And that show, it, it's looking at the arc of human reproduction through the lens of design. And so I produced pieces in wooden form that talked about my experience as a, as a mother and the process of becoming a mom. Um, and, you know, to be continued, I didn't finish the series. I produced pieces for that show, um, and pandemic hit, and racial awakening happened in our society, and black moms were suffering in a different way than a lot of other folks. Um, I have a mom's group that I started in Boston. I, I live in Boston, in the Jamaica Plain area in Boston. Um, and I reached out to the group and said, do y'all want to come together on Zoom? specifically looking for black moms that want to have community in this really isolated time. So we started to meet on Zoom. Um, I got grant funding. We facilitated conversations. We would like kind of sometimes you would help facilitate on Zoom. Um, other moms would too. And then we met in person right when, you remember that moment when the pandemic, we thought it was lifting and everyone was like, yes, it's June, it's nice, it's warm, we're going to be out in public and, and kind of come together in spaces. Um, and we did that. We did that on Lauren Greeno Yard in Jamaica Plain. Um, and I invited Bintu to really guide us through this process of being together. It's, that title, that piece, is called We Are Black Vessels, I think. <laughs> right? <laughs> we're trying to remember the titles of the work. Um, and so I just wanted to to think about that a little bit and have been to share about your work and the body of practice and why you were excited to participate or interested in participating in that piece of bringing those moms together and what we did together. Of course. Um, and excited is absolutely an understatement, just to be clear. Um, so I based everything around traditional West African dance. It's my culture. It's what I grew up in. And when we immigrated to the U.S., it was the one thing. Actually, it was the one thing that felt like it was mine alone to hold on to. The food was something that would stay at home. Our language stayed at home, but the dance did not have to stay at home. And so that was the one thing I would actually be able to share with everyone. And when we're based in Nashville, New Hampshire, it was just me in my class, and that was it for from freshman year until I graduated from high school. Um, and what I learned in that process was the fact that people wanted to connect, and one of the fastest ways to connect was actually through movement. Um, whether it's movement of wood into someone that's just coming in, I, exactly like that, or it's just the fact that I could be able to walk, right? So movement in the sense of walking, movement in the sense of just being in existence. And so over the years, I combined West African dance. I still teach traditional West African dance, but I realized that I actually wanted to do a lot more. So I started taking West African dance and exploring where it has traveled outside of the continent. So that's where Racines came from. Um, over the years, I've brought different artists together to explore dance, traditional West African dance through the Americas, how we went through the West Indies, Haiti, and uh, Brazil, and the US, and how dance morphed from 
the Charleston came from a dance called Mamba or how we have swing dance, you know, how we have hip hop, all of those being the connectivities all in that space. And so that brings me to Boston, living in Boston, being a performing artist in Boston and a teaching artist in Boston. And entering motherhood for the first time, completely different than what I expected motherhood was going to be. Right? And everything everyone tells you to be afraid of was a, did not faze me, but the things that we did not speak about were the things that were really difficult. And so at that time, a saving grace was actually going to be created and having mothers of color in that group to say, this is what my experience is, and you facilitated a space, you created a sacred space where I could bring my full run of itself into that space. Mm -hmm. So within that mama group, we had joys, we had, we shared joys, we shared sorrows, we shared hardships, we shared accomplishment and celebrated each other, mm -hmm. and we held each other at our lowest points and lifted each other up. And that's what I absolutely love about it. And so when you mentioned this about this project, at that point I was entering year two of not being able to fully dance, mm. not being able to fully move in the way that I wanted to because year one was just survival. Year two, the pandemic hit and I'm home and the extent of my movement at this point is yoga or rolling around on the floor, what I call squid. My daughter and I were like, we're going to be squids. So we flop on the floor and move our bodies around the squids would, and that feels incredible. But it was not the level of motion that I was used to. Mm -hmm. It was not the level of community I was used to. It's that African dance really cultivates a sense of community. And so when you brought this, it felt like a lifeline to be like, yes, I can get back into a space where I'm surrounded by others. I can get back to a community. And I can connect with the people I've been connecting with for this whole period of time in person. And that shift alone was something I was so excited about that when I met everyone, it felt like I had known them my whole life, even though the extent of our relationship was strictly on its own. And that space that you created allowed us to, this video is wonderful and it feels like it doesn't even touch the amount of joys and connectivity and just sheer humanity that we're able to touch with in that space. And you not only created the space for that to happen, but you facilitated the twine that connected us to the point where you were able to then bring different forms of art or collaboration with the other artists. Um, but that actually made me curious at the point where I'm like now looking at this and saying, did you have this all in mind from the beginning? Was this <laughs> this is what you were thinking about and how because you had the idea of vessels you talked about the idea of human like mothers being vessels right mm -hmm. and so how does this vessel for you show up in your personal life in your public practice and in this space that you created for the black moons as well mm -hmm. so I don't have I, I think my public practice when you think about it like that I'm an art administrator and for many years, people would ask me, you know, to introduce myself or kind of define who I am. And I think of art administration kind of doesn't do it justice for a lot of organizations and leaders, folks that work behind the scenes. You really, it's a it's a creative practice of how do we bring people together? How do we bring people together? Um, how do we cultivate spaces that support and allow people to kind of be and grow into who they are or who they want to be or who they should be for the rest of us. It's all of those things. Um, so I don't have a plan. I didn't have a plan. I like wrote a grant, got a little bit of money, was like, all right, let's do this. Like, what do y'all need? <laughs> like, what do we need together? Like, literally on Zoom, like, are you interested in meeting? Good, because I got some money. Let's figure this out. We'll pay for a babysitter. Yes. We'll like be on the space and like do whatever we need. Like, let's create a space that fulfills and, and um, fulfills what we need in this moment and helps us thrive in a time where we're focused so much on the negativity and what's pulling us down. That's what society is putting out there and we need to counter that for our survival and for us to, to thrive. Um, and so, so, you know, this idea of vessel, you know, I've been attracted to these forms for years, curved forms, what they hold, um, when I was younger, I used to hide in small spaces because I liked to feel safe. 
and protected. Um, for hours, like, people wouldn't be able to find me. I'd be under the kitchen table. I'd be in the closet in the corner. Um, and so this, these spaces, oftentimes when I'm building them or thinking about them, I'm imagining being inside of them, having that experience of being protected and supported and cared for. Um, and, and that shows up in our lived experiences often where we don't really put words to it, um, but it's, you know, why we like really good hugs. Like, you know, that there's a feeling to that. There's a support to that. Um, so I think about those things in kind of these abstract ways. Um, and then I try to, like, facilitate us together. Like, I created this moms group, and I you know my husband's white. My kids are mixed. They're going to grow up and be viewed as all kinds of things by other people. And I created this moms group because I wanted my kids to be in a space that I have helped to shape that reflects their identity and my identity, more importantly, because I am darker skinned than they are and I really wanted people around them that could reflect who they are. So I created this vessel of moms in the neighborhood and I literally on playgrounds, on the sidewalk, in a restaurant, I'm that person of like, hey, so I notice you're a personal color. <laughs> you want to join my, you have a kid, you want to join my group. We're looking for people in the neighborhood because we want to support each other. And every, no one ever said no. Everyone was like, yes, how do I get to be a part of that? And they, they came together and, and were a part of that space. I'm still the one that like holds it up primarily. Yes. yes. I'm still the one that's like, we did pumpkin carving, we did this, we did that, like all the things I'm like planning them. And I keep telling other people, just like the racial equity and crack group, like you can you can step in this in the center and help build the space with us. And that's work and it takes time and it takes um, like a confidence in doing that likely. And I'm used to it because I'm an art administrator. And so I keep creating these spaces for folks. And what's fulfilling to me, when I think about it as a creative practice, is I see folks enter that space, and you and I invited you in, and you said, yes, I'll participate, and yes, I'll lead, and yes, it'll be something that I need in the moment because I'm a creative person that's yearning to be back in my creative practice. And the other mothers are saying, how, like by the end of that weekend, they're saying, I am participating in building this space for us to be fulfilled. Yes. And that was really important. And it, and then I'm, I wrote, wrote a different grant that helped to get us to the next phase. And so to me, it's like a work in progress, and it's going to evolve. And I'm hoping, I do this in, in my work at the Elliott School. I started teaching woodworking, intro to woodworking kind of program for black femme-identifying folks. And I, the thought was, the wood shop for me was not a space that reflected my identity. It was not a space that really kind of cultivated and met me where I was at. There were individuals that did that, but the space spaces that I walked in didn't necessarily do that. And so I'm trying to create as an example of me in another space saying, how do we create this as really an intentional vessel right. where we're gonna like claim our boundaries, we're gonna recognize we're gonna do this a little differently. We're going to acknowledge that there's some fear in the woodshop, that there's um, some, we get intimidated, and there's some kind of identity struggles of, is this built for me? Well, we're going to, we're going to shape it to be built for you. And so those woodworking programs felt very different than other ones. We were cheering as soon as you went through the table saw and utilized it. Um, and someone was scared, and then they were like, okay, second time around, now I'm going to do it. And so you, the whole shop was like cheering that they did this whole different experience than, than what I participated in when I was a, a younger person in, in the shop. So I just think about that and I'm like, that's the awesome. thing is the fact that you're doing this on a physical level, but it's also the physical, at a physical sense as well, right? You're creating these really strong relationships, as you mentioned, to like raise our kids in. Um, but you're also holding space, and I think that's also part of that vessel concept. Yeah. Right? You're literally holding space for everyone around, and you're shifting you're shifting the needle on what we need, especially when it comes to how isolating motherhood can be for everyone, but even more so isolating for black people. Yeah. Isolating. That's, yeah. So this is going to bring me to the kind of the next thing I want to touch on, which is, so Bintu was in Boston. We just became like really close friends. And part of this process in that, um, that y'all see captured in the video is part of that friendship 
and the intertwining of artistic practice. Like you meet people as parents or whatever the identity is that brought you together, and then you realize you have these lives that you connect with. Um, and since then, Bintu moved to outside of DC. Yes. He's like, what is happening? Where are you going? I get it's warmer, <laughs> but it's away from me and my family. Um, and I feel like we were just starting to see how the artistic practices can intertwine and flourish and how we redefine those practices as, as mothers with older kids. Like we were, I feel like at this kind of transition point in the US. Yes. And then we haven't, we barely have spoken. It's like here we are together. Spiral. We're like texting and we don't hear back from each other for a month at a time. Nava understands because communication <laughs> was very sporadic. Um, and so I just want to recognize that we're off in our, in our survival modes kind of doing this work, and she has a, a one-year-old, so she's very much in survival mode. Um, and so I just want to recognize that we're talking about vessels and what we hold, and we're a community together, all together. Okay. So I'm going to ask you, like, what are you holding in this moment in, in the ways that you feel comfortable sharing, mm -hmm. and who's holding you in this moment? I feel like it's almost, I'm holding way too much. Realistically, I'm holding way too much. And that's partly because there's, of course, the, the work you, there is the human you that's outside of work, there's the family you, there's the me that is previously in the studio all the time, dancing and moving. Um, most recently, my husband had an accident where he fell down the stairs and broke his back. And so my I can say this without going into complete, like, <gasps> because it happened about four months ago. Um, but it went from us coming from a wonderful vacation. <laughs> and the first day back, the kids have school the next day. We have to prep for daycare. We have to prep for preschool. He has to go back. He's a teacher. So we have to prep for school. I have to prep to go back into work, transitioning on a major project. And he fell down the stairs. And luckily he was okay. And luckily the one-year-old was fine because it was one of the one-year-old. And so in that space, realizing that my partner, who is literally, we do everything together. We, I'm lucky in the sense that I have shared, we have absolutely shared ownership of our home and our family life. No longer is able to do any of the things that he would actually normally do for the family. And of course, I entered a place of, what on earth am I going to do with this? Are you serious right now? And so making sure he was okay, making sure the kids were okay, making sure this was happening. That level of chaos that happened within the first week, I found that I don't know how it, I did it, but I do know that it would not have happened. I would not have been able to get across that first two weeks without the community that I had built. Mm -hmm. um, we had family members that flew in from Boston, family members that came in from Maine. We had friends that dropped food off every single day. We had friends that called me up and said, I'm going to take your little one, four-year-old, for play dates. Please do. She has a lot of energy. Please take her. Uh, we, had, we had such a wealth of community around us mm -hmm. that it validated our transition to move to Maryland. And the reason why we actually moved to Maryland is actually quite funny because I don't think I actually mentioned this to you. By the time I met you, we were already in the process of relocating because Boston felt isolated, and even more so after the birth of our child. And we were the only ones that looked like us. <laughs> in the communities you were working in. the communities yeah. we were in. From my work, from where we lived, we were the only ones that looked like us. And so by the time I met you and we're building this community, I was like, oh, if only I'd met you about a year earlier, I would have been able to stay in Boston. I must have better. Still can't <laughs> <laughs> and so to be able to move to this new space and be able to build that similar community within a year versus 10 years in Boston, and before that, another 15 years in Boston, felt like absolutely mind blown to have a community that mirrors that reflects my husband and myself, our values, our, it was incredible. So holding my husband for me, he's still injured, he's still unable to be fully back to work. My mom is an elder, she's in her 70s, and she's now in a state where I am now doing my best to step into care for her. 
and not care because she needs to be careful, but care because she's done enough. She's she's done enough. <laughs> she's raised six kids, and you know, I'm the youngest, so she's she's incredible. So there's all these roles that I'm constantly navigating and holding, and holding space for people in my family, holding space for people that work as a supervisor or a director. That. I think it's easy for me to forget that sometimes I am being held back. Mm. It's really easy because I don't allow, always allow time to be held. Because we don't have time. We have the one year old, the three, the four year old, the husband, the house, the work, all of these things that are peripherals constantly make, take up space in that for us. Mm. But when we allow time to be held, we have the community to be. I remember when you called and you said, how are you doing? I was like, well, how much time do you have? <laughs> and I was just like, all of these things happened to us. And you're like, yes, all of these things are happening too. And that was your holding space for me, right? It's my three-year-old realizing I'm having a hard day and saying, I'm going to give you a hug and just like, yeah. that helps. And she's holding you. Yes, absolutely. And my work creating policies that allow us to have a work-life balance that's not focused on being extractive from the human component of things, mm -hmm. right? So my work implemented a policy where you're not allowed to have any meetings before 10 a.m. That is that is absolutely significant for someone who has to drop off tiny humans to daycare, navigate traffic, get into work, transition to be your work self and sit in front of a computer all day long. That, those policies do hold the whole human being. Yeah. And most recently, I started dancing again. <laughs> yes, so bad. Um, and then the last thing is, I actually, over the years, I learned to hold myself. And it's similar to the practice that we did, where you actually have specific hand holding or self holding practices that allow you to just reconnect mm -hmm. with your own self as your vessel. Um, and as you do this, you're taking deep breaths, you're actually regulating your breath, you're slowing down your thinking processes so you don't have your synapses going a million miles an hour. You're slowing everything down and centering yourself. Yeah. And all of those pieces, it feels like a lot that we all have to hold, right? Especially at a time where it feels like joy and care and love so scarce in the general collective world, that if you can find those moments of recognizing that you're being held, even when it feels like you're not, there are people who are holding you. Yeah. And so that's like all around that corner. That's all the things you're holding. Yes. And just as so, a lot of the conversations I have and kind of how I exist in the world is bringing these things that are in the private into public space. So it, it, it's a lot to ask you, what are you holding? Because that's a lot. It's a lot to share with you all. But just to recognize that we are all holding a lot. Yes. And we, like, it's important to bring it in the public space so that we can, as a society and a group of people, work together to support it and hold it. Right? Um, when in planning for this, we talked about planning how this conversation might might exist, and you mentioned um, a process in, in kind of Japanese uh, culture in, in teacups, yes. and, and this process of like repairing them. Yes. And so I just want to you know, take a moment to get to the physical objects that we are actually in the space about physical objects, um, and thinking about this repair process. And if you could share a little bit, because I'm not familiar with. Oh, that. absolutely. I so kintsugi is the term, and it's the art of repairing traditionally ceramics with gold. So they're repaired with lacquer and those lacquer are painted with gold. And that practice resonated with me because anything that's created can break. Absolutely. Anything that's created can break. And I think there is this concept that when things break that they are it's not possible to be repaired again. It's impossible to repair it the way it was never, you can never tell it was broken. It's like it's always broken. You broke once, you can repair it. But Kintsugi focuses on how the imperfect actually is so incredibly beautiful. So you have this 
let's take the teacup, ceramic teacup, that shatters. And someone lovingly, time consumingly, puts it back together with backer. That takes time for it to actually solidify together and become solid again. Then time is the added to paint it with all our knowledge. And what you end up with is this incredibly beautiful vessel that is absolutely unique. It's absolutely precious. It's precious from like if you want to look at a you know at a quantifiable financial basis, it is expensive because you're utilizing one of the most precious minerals we have or substances we have on earth, right? But what makes it even more precious is the fact that you're repairing and the importance lies in how you repair. You could repair it and it could be a quick repair without lot of like intentionality around it, but to repair with intentionality, to repair with actual purpose, that takes you much longer. And it resonated with me from an art, from my own personal embodiment practice, because I ended up with two C-sections. One that was incredibly traumatic, and I was left with a body that I did not recognize when I looked in the mirror. And so Kintsugi reminded me that those scars, well, those scars are actually being used for a way where I can repair and heal, that is even more valuable in my life moving forward. It's going to add value in my life. How I repair is going to actually dictate how I move forward. And that level of preciousness in repairing happens in relationships where if you have a relationship where you have conflict and there's discord. How you repair that actually make that relationship even stronger after right? And you can build a relationship that's strong enough to survive any argument you may have or disagreement you may have, as long as you're actually putting precious intentionality and care in the repair process. And so it's shifting that into actual body space. And body in practice is a, is a one space for me that I've found where my physical, my mental, and my emotional selves mm -hmm can be healed at the same time as I move forward. I can also do it in spaces. As I mentioned, waking up in the morning and being a squid in the morning, that actually is joyful because, one, I think a human squid is just a silly, ridiculous <laughs> idea to begin with. But to do it with a toddler or a tiny human, there's so much joy that's infused in my morning immediately right off the bat. I have so much joy, I have laughter, I have chaos, and it's wonderful. And that moment, I'm also building a really strong relationship with my tiny human, where she's going to go to school, and that's going to set the tone for the rest of the day. And so there are times when I'm going to pick her up, and she will be dancing and saying, today's going to be a great day. And that's her mantra, right? <laughs> today's going to be a great day. And in the middle of the street, I will join her because that's the relationship I've built with her in my repair process. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I would say is that I recently learned, I recently, like a few years ago, learned that for every one negative interaction you have, you need approximately five to balance it. Right? So that's the repair process. So whenever I have a single interaction that is not, doesn't sit well in my body, I need to make sure I can actually use more joy, more life, more care, more love, more chaos <laughs> into it so it allows that shift to happen. But that's what Kintsugi is. It's actually embracing the imperfections of life, not erasing it, but moving it to a place where you are now accepting the self as something more precious. Mm -hmm. right? That doesn't mean I don't still have the C-section without I absolutely still do. Now it just jiggles and dances with the little one as well, and it's <laughs> so much fun. And it's so cuddly, so that my one year old can like fuck on it. <laughs> it's so much fun. Right? Yes. See the private things, <laughs> putting them in public space. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's my body is never going to be the way it was before. My mental state is not going to be that the way it was before I had kids. My emotional state is not going to be that way. But what it is is the fact that as I move forward with each like mm -hmm. translation of myself, yeah. I'm able to build that relationship with myself by healing in a way that I can accept my imperfections. And I can highlight them in gold. I can make them valuable. I can make them precious. Because at the end of the day, that relationship with myself is 
going to dictate my relationship with everyone else. Yeah. So it's just because it's broken does not mean that it's actually in value. Yeah. In the repair process, you can create something even more precious. And I think that's probably similar with you in your woodwork, right? I mean, your work itself is a constant building and reframing things so that they can actually stay together. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a struggle to hold this idea of perfection that you try to work towards. And as a maker of phys physical objects, and I'm sure there's makers in the audience, where you have this idea of what something should be. And I'm a, I'm a perfectionist. But it, like All the processes we use are all flawed, and they're not perfect, and you make these objects, and they do what they want, and the material that I work in primarily is wood. <laughs> so wood you know, responds to its environment. And even the, we talked about the pieces in the studio, um, you know, I think they were really wet at one point, the, the lumber, and then I cut it apart and started to make these pieces, and they started to pull apart. They started to, like, the fibers, the actual fibers, not just at the joints, but the fibers were starting to pull apart as the climate was shifting, as the moisture was leaving the, the material. So I'll say, like, this idea of repair is something I'm thinking about a lot in um, craft as, as a sector, like, as a... Um, Folks that make and produce objects that are that exist in the world that we make, that we interact with, that we utilize. How do we repair them? How do in buildings that we have in our natural environment, our, our neighborhoods, school buildings, like how do we repair them so that they are precious and cultivate like the spaces that we want them to? Um, I think about it on the small scale and the large scale. This idea of repair, and I, and I'll say like it's uncomfortable. It's like the um, I want it to be pristine. And some of them feel pristine and then they immediately deteriorate. Some of them in the process of making, they break apart or a machine tears at it and you have to fix it. Um, and it's this like deliberate, careful process of like, are you choosing to hide that repair? Or are you choosing to highlight it? So thinking about it, you know, when you're talking around about the gold um, and like making it precious in the process of, of repairing it, it's not, like I'm not quite there yet in my personal art practice. Like I'm still in the like, let's make it pristine. <laughs> like, like let's really embrace that and like keep failing at it, right? Um, and then when you think about, you're talking about C sections, um, which I'm so grateful that I was part of the Designing Motherhood exhibit because it highlighted and brought to light a lot of these concepts or these um, things that women go through in, in childbirth that are not not part of everyday discussion in homes where women's bodies grow and exist. Um, and I did, that resonated a lot with me because, you know, in the process of growing, like, our bodies are vessels. Right? We grow humans. And they leave us, <laughs> physically leave us, and then later on leave their homes and all the other things, which I am already dreading. Um, but I think about this, and in the process, I'm a small person, and that process really did tear me apart. Like, it's, that's, like, literal. Um, and in April, I had surgery to bring all that tearing in the abs in my midsection back together. Like I had a hernia, I had diastasis recti, which is a separation of the abs. Or even people talk about mom bod, like, you know, such a nice phrase, mom bod. Um, but you think about this and you're like, this is the process of growing humans, of stre stretching apart to make space for this thing that you care about and love and nurture. And then that thing leaves and the body does not, does not bounce back. It does not grow back. Um, and it's sometimes it physically harms you. So that if you don't do those things that correct that, that repair that, um, that harm shows up later. So, I, you know, when you talk about like making it precious, and I mean, it's like I have a scar down from here to here. Yeah. Um, like literally. <laughs> and, I, and I feel it, like, constantly. Um, but I am the strongest I've been since the, fir the first child. Yes. Like I'm st stronger, probably, than I was. 
us. And so trying to like own that, embrace that, that new definition of who we are, that new visual, um, that visual of who we are, owning it and like embracing it as precious, I think is an important part of it. And I, and I think about it in those objects, but I recognize I'm not there yet. I'm really in the like pristine, and then I'm like, God, it's not perfect. <laughs> and I like, want to like really embrace the repair. And I'm so, like, I'm trying to like work looser so that I can embrace the repair because if it's made kind of not carelessly, but with with a different type of care, then the repair becomes kind of an easier thing to accept. So I, I'm like the creative kind of abandon kind of grappling <laughs> with that. <laughs> Like if I if I make every like I, these are made on the bandsaw primarily, but I still bring a bandsaw cut for folks who don't know. It's a much rougher cut than a table saw cut, um, and I still adjusted the edges and everything to come back together in a pristine way. But if I can embrace the bandsaw cut, then the repair when it when things are not perfect. In my mind, at least, the idea of that repair, I can be more accepting of it because the first thing didn't feel as pristine right. or as precious, which is backwards. Yeah. But I, this is my process in it's the no wooden backwards. object. It's of, like just... trying to embrace it. So, anyway, that's like a little moment into my head of like circular thinking around making of like, how do I, how do I embrace the imperfect? I don't think it's backwards. I think it's the like, regardless of what process we take, getting to where we want to get to is still that is part of the journey, right? Yeah. So, um, and I think realistically for me, it's easier for me to focus on that with body wise because I am the strongest I've ever been. Afterwards, physical therapy, all of those things we had to do. But um, I want to hop back to repair. One of the things that you mentioned is like this preciousness shows up again time and time in our relationships and everything of that sort. But I also want you to talk about the other ways you connected the other mamas in the work that you're doing. Because there's so much to the point when I left Boston and all these things were happening and I was seeing them on Facebook and on Zoom. I felt so much envy and jealousy around not being there to do it with you guys. So yeah. I'd love for you to highlight those as well. Yeah, so on the other side of, you know, I brought moms together in this time of racial awakening as society is like, oh, Wow, we like kind of built an imperfect system here, <laughs> and you know, <laughs> black folks are saying, "Yeah, we've been saying that, right?" And moms are saying, "I'm tired of our children dying. I'm tired of seeing this on the news and people looking the other way." And the sorrow was deep, and it felt like every Zoom call we had, it was just like, "How are we?" And we're just trying to kind of survive that moment and not get pulled out further into it. And on the, so as we brought together these moms, as the pandemic kind of lifted and, and tightened back up and lifted again, I start like I applied for another brand. I was like, I need to keep this process going. If I'm gonna have a, a creative process that is about community engagement and about building that community I want to be a part of, I gotta do it in my art practice and I gotta get a grant <laughs> to fund me to do it. And so Collective Futures Fund supported this work where I, I, I um, basically pitched working with two other black mom artists in Boston to bring moms together around joy. And this term that um, Tanya wanted, Tanya Nixon Silver, one of the artists that um, I'm working with, she keeps talking about unadulterated black joy. And we're like, yes, that's the project title, that's what we're doing. And we're just like, late night, kids are in bed, we're writing this grant, we're submitting this grant to get some funding. And so we were able to bring moms together, black moms together, in joyous community. And so, and we thought about what, would, what are the things that hold true for black moms, and we think about like black girlhood and joy when we were young folks. Um, I grew up in Winston-Salem, chalk drawings on the sidewalk, double dutch in the street, um, roller skating under the carport or um, at a roller skating rink. Like, things like that were joyous. Um, and so we 
pitch like, okay, Bam's Fest happens in the summer. We're going to do a hula hooping at Bam Fest. It's a, a musical festival. We did. We rented out Chez Vu, which is a roller skating rink in Boston. Um, rented out the whole place for black moms to skate for like three or four hours. I skated from the moment I stepped in that place to the moment I left, and it was the best like three hours. <laughs> Demons up there, I think, and I was like, literally, like, put kids to bed. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> so we roller skated. Um, Tanya worked with um, uh, Commonwealth Commonwealth Circus um, in Jamaica Plain, and they did a aerial class for Black moms. So about seven, I think, seven moms that participated. I had just had the surgery, so I couldn't participate. But they learned the silks and hanging on hoops and all, all the things. And she's going to do another this. class for that. Um, one of the moms that participated had just had a baby. And I was like, are you sure? And she, and she participated and, and made adjustments. And then the rest, she was like, I just wanted to be in the space. I'm just going to sit and watch people. Um, and, and it's feeling like you can be fully yourself. And people people see you. And people participate and enjoy. Um, but it's hard to find as a parent, I think. Yes. Um, and so we've been bringing folks together to do these Gatherings. We have an exhibition in May. Um, we've invited two other Black Mom artists, so it'll be five artists doing an exhibition where we've like rented out a gallery space and we're just doing it all ourselves and highlighting work around Black motherhood. Um, and we'll see. Like I'm going to keep trying to get more funds to pay pay people, like get babysitters, whatever is needed, so that folks can come together and. Um, build community together. And sometimes all it takes is the, the invitation. Absolutely. So these moms didn't know each other, some of them. We like shared it out in different spaces and we really, like one, one person was like, well one of my New Year's resolutions is to make more friends and to put myself out there. She showed up, went to some skates, and skated for three hours with us and fell a lot. <laughs> yes. um, and so it, it's, it's just like, how do we bring back joy? Um, and if we bring back joy, is that preparing some of yes. the damage? Is yes. that cultivating Absolutely. the healing process? Absolutely. I mean, that's literally what I was saying. By doing that, we are actually stepping into a place where we are repairing from, from the news, from the reality of what is outside of us. Yeah. But also, as you mentioned, I don't think we have a culture where parents are allowed to play or where adults are allowed to play in a true form of play. Right? We have things that adults do to enjoy, usually go to the bar and drink, but to actually yeah. play, we don't have a culture that embraces adults who to do that, and even less so for mothers to do that. Yeah. So by doing that, absolutely we're entering the space of repair on a community, individual, and on a whole intrinsic collective level. Yeah. So I could go on about that. And Vincent wanted it was important that we end on joy in our conversation. So just to highlight that that's like that's the work that's happening in Boston now. I wonder what's ha- you know what's happening in the communities in Philly and communities where you're living around joy and and around joy for folks of color in those communities because it's important. Um, and our society is really good at highlighting the negativity. And so how do we highlight that positivity? I sit in the car with Ezra who loves listening to the news, loves it. And I have to turn it off and say, like, it's all it's highlighting is the negativity. So where where are those spaces? So I'm gonna we're gonna open it up for questions, um, but I want to urge folks to think about that, like, find that joy, highlight it, support it, um, because that's I think what's gonna help to repair some of these things in our society that we're currently experiencing. Um, but that's that's our conversation. So are there questions that folks want to ask? Yep. I enjoyed listening to the conversation. Uh, I do have this question. It's based on like, you seem very intentional about finding uh, spaces where uh, people who look like you or your black moms or um, you know, you're trying to build this community um, and I guess in, in your life. And intentionally finding like black people in my business and focus um, How do you reconcile that with the fact that your partner is black? You know, you weren't really intentional in finding a partner that was black. But it seems like it's very important to you that find a community that 
impact of life. And I think it's important to kind of talk about that, especially if you're in a room of white people. So I don't have a dog, right? but I just would like yeah. you know, to hear your thoughts on that. That's a good, good question. Um, I think about that a lot. I think about that a lot. I will say in everybody's experience is different, right? So I'm just going to speak to mine. Um, I met my husband when I was 17 at a summer camp. And at the time, I was in a lot of white spaces growing up. Um, so I was went from a public school to a certain grade and then switched to private school um, because I was acting a fool. My mom was like, I'm getting scholarships and getting you into private schools. So I was in a lot of white spaces, and that was good and bad for me. Um, and at that moment in time, going through, like growing up, and then meeting someone that you had a connection with that didn't, I grew up in the South, so I didn't fit into any spaces. I wasn't black enough for the black, black community for my neighborhood. My parents are from Guyana. So I had, my parents had a funny accent, according to folks. I wasn't white, and I was not accepted in those spaces either. Um, and in Winston-Salem, you were, at the time, you were either white, black, or Mexican. And I wasn't Mexican. So that, that, that idea of, like, where do you fit? Where, where do you feel comfortable? Where do you feel seen? Where do you feel supported? I think, for me, it was really hard growing up. And, and we met then at 17, we dated, and I was going through a really hard time with my family, and, and we our connection was strong. And that's what a relationship is about, right? You find people, and, they're, and they help to strengthen that. Um, and we went our separate ways, and then we found ourselves again. We dated folks. I dated all identities of, not all, but some identities of folks. And then found him again, and we reconnected, and we worked really hard to build, build our lives. I mean, that's just the reality of what it is, right? Um, and I'll say, like, my space that I find and create as an adult is intentional. And when I was a young person, it wasn't up to me. It was the spaces that were created around me that I participated in, and sometimes um, I was shaped by, and sometimes I was like, kind of shaped as a kind of counter to or response against those spaces. Um, so I think it's... It's a good thing to bring into the public space of thinking about you know, identity and who we choose as life partners, how we raise our children. I will say, like, I love my husband, and he saw me, and he connected with me, and I did the same for him, and that's who we found. And I have biracial children. I have multiracial children because we're both mixed of, of other identities, and I'm doing the best I can to create a space where they don't feel isolated the way that I did. Um, because they're not white. They're not black. They're somewhere in between, and I can hear them now talking, they're probably touching your artwork up there. <laughs> but, I can, <laughs> but, but, I, but I just to recognize that like, I think it's complicated, and I, all I can do is be intentional about creating the spaces where my, my kids feel as, com as more comfortable and seen than I did. And their life partners and life choices are their own. I can actually say that really resonates with me as well. And part of that is similar. Being an immigrant, ended up landing in Hampshire. I was surrounded by a lot of whiteness. And that level of being in the world translates to not just me being, the minute I step outside of my home, everyone around me was someone that looked completely different than me, that translated into the environments I worked in, where I was tokenized in many different spaces working in. So I also work in finance on the other side of things. And I can tell you, there aren't a lot of black female CFOs in this world, unfortunately, right? So being in that space where you're constantly in a space of whiteness informed spaces, it does help to cultivate intentionality around how you actually embody yourself. So full transparency, my husband is also white, and he is fully white. He is Irish, Scottish-ish. He's, 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 he's white, right? 
And that's not from lack of being with partners who were black. I have partners who were black. And similarly, I encounter the level of not being black enough. And to be truthful, my experience as a black woman is completely different than a black American's experience. Right? And I'm going to always uphold that value and extend it. And choosing a partner meant that I had to choose a partner and I was going to be with someone who understood my blackness as much as they possibly could with their own lens. As the same way I can only understand the black American experience as much as I can with my immigrant lens. It's a whole, you know, there's a whole conversation around black Africans versus black Americans and that can become a bit turbulent, so to speak, because there's a lot of ill-conceived notions that some have against the others. But what I hold true is the fact that black Americans have created passages that allow Africans to come into the space, right? I uphold that. And I also understand that I will never be able to fully comprehend the black American experience. So being told, and I was actually told that I was not black enough by a black American, I will accept that correction. And I will continue learning it. And it means that I'm going to choose a partner who will actually join me on that learning of it. And so my partner was chosen based on values. Same thing. We separated multiple times because he had his journey to go on and I had my journey to go on. And learning how to be, I had to learn how to be black in America. Because I went from being the African girl with a really thick African accent to being, um, sorry, I went from being the Dominican. Right? I'm an Indian, I can speak my language, I can connect it to my, to my ancestors all the way through, to being West African, because it was easier for people to understand that I'm just West African. In Nashville, New Hampshire, I'm West African. You don't need to know which country I'm from, because you don't really, you don't seem like you're really interested in that some of Right? That's the narrative that I encountered in New Hampshire. To be in West African, to be in the back, black world. And so... The only time people question my blackness is usually when I open my mouth and speak. And especially when I open my mouth and speak after speaking to my mom for a couple of hours. <laughs> right? So in that space, I'm absolutely not embodying the black American experience, but I can also be able to uplift that experience as much as I can in my work and in the people that I actually surround myself with. So that's where my intentionality is, making sure that my value-aligned family Moving that space. So, quick, quick. My other white guy, his whole family's back, right? Like, literally, everyone was there. I went to a wedding and I was literally the only person of color. And in that space, I felt a certain level of feeling comfortable, not just because I grew up in Nashville, New Hampshire, surrounded by whiteness, but because in that space, I have had conversations and continue to have conversations about race and equity and justice and belonging with those people because they are now part of my extended families. And if I'm going to trust my children with you, yeah. you need to be able to have that conversation with them. Mm-hmm. That's where my intentionality comes in. Yeah. So would I have said I'm going to absolutely date only a black person or marry only a black person and that's it? If the cards had that for me, absolutely. It also meant that I needed to find someone who <laughs> was interested in anime and art and all these like <laughs> things that were considered a peripheral at the time that I'm now mainstream actually, which is a little bit ridiculous, but you know, so I'm in spaces of blackness a lot nowadays. And I'm in part of an anime group. And quite often you see both men and female posting, where were you guys when I was in high school? Mm-hmm. You are not the only ones that have that experience. And you find a lot of black people do have that experience as well. Where there are things that they're passionate and connected with that are not in their shared community. So they find the people that they connect with on that level. The secondary layer is making sure that its values are aligned. And that's where for me I feel really close to my family. Sorry, did I speak quite a bit in my yeah. I was I was in I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for folks? Yeah. Yeah, hi. I so appreciate this conversation. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, a lot of things that you shared have really resonated with me. I'm a fiber artist who creates vessels. Mm. And um, uh, my work has been around holding space. And um, so I'm so grateful. One of the things, I, I think this, this, this uh, the, the questions and your, your, your responses 
made me think about um, um, how I often uh, have a conversation with myself about uh, creating art that uh, reflects the black experience and uh, black tragedy, but I'm also working on joy now too. Mm -hmm. that, that was a big transition. Um, but, but I but I often think about uh, my my upbringing and my my life in general has been a very diverse life, full of all kinds of people, uh, all kinds you know white, uh, Asian, just all over. And uh, I often ask myself and have conversations with myself around, you know, um, um, I guess I'm sort of looking for permission within myself uh, or within the universe to. Uh, create, it's giving myself permission to, to actually create work that actually, that, that speaks to my experience as a black person, that speaks to the black experience in general, given that there are so many other experiences that make up our universe. It's just like, it's, it's okay to just focus as you are, uh, or when you do, on the black experience. And I'm wondering if you you know, have have those same same kind of conversations with yourself. Do you understand what I'm what I'm saying? Yeah, like make work to make work or make work about who you are. Yeah, I, and I think about that a lot. Um, when I was at RISD in school, I didn't make work about my identity. There's no way to make the work, and it's not about your identity. But I did not say it was about my identity. I did not um, think about it in those terms. I was trying to strip the identity away to make work and be considered a craftsperson, a maker. And to be able to have my work looked at and critiqued alongside white makers. I'm going to strip away identity, then it was just to be critiqued along, you know, and thought of at the same level as everyone else, to be like, um, thought about as a legitimate maker. And that somehow my identity would have devalued it or there's like part of that thinking. There's also this thinking of if I do work about who I am and explicitly talk about that, then the professors and peers do not have the language and the experiences to critique that in a way that would be helpful and not harmful to me. Um, and I did, my work at school was in the wood shop and metal shop and making uh, furniture sometimes more sculptural furniture because I tend to not make rectangular things. Um, and really in, uh, rooted in community engagement. So I did a, uh, my senior thesis was making children's furniture for high school students at a local um, charter school. And this was an example where identity is mixed up in there. I was working with primarily black and brown students, and, and it was important to me. And I saw it clearly that this fit in the furniture department. I am making kids' furniture with high school students, and I'm and I'm focused on the curriculum piece. I'm focused on how do I get young people to engage in this? How do we get them to think about all the things they need to think about? And I'll say the critique process, one on one with the professor, and even in classrooms, was really disappointing and frustrating. And I remember telling myself, just like kind of gearing up for it and saying, okay, you know what you need to do. You know where you're going with this. And almost regardless of what this professor says, you got to keep doing it. And, and just don't take it personally. Don't do that because it's not like basically like just ignore what they're saying and do the work. And this was the closest that I put my identity out for that in that public space in a classroom environment. Um, and it was hard. And at the end, I was like, well, fuck it. Like, I'm just going to make the work. And, like, if they want to engage in that, that's their business. And if they don't have the framework to engage in it in a helpful way, I'm not going to listen to it because I have to keep doing this work. And I'll say, like, now I'm in a different place. First, I've grown up a lot. First, I've lived through a lot of different things, and my, like, identity has shifted and evolved. And I'm in a position of power. I have, I'm an associate director at a nonprofit. I'm not dependent on my art salary or my furniture salary. I'm dependent on the salary from a nonprofit. So I'm in a place where I've, I've waited to a time where I can, without risking a lot, dive into my work through my, and be really explicit about my identity and my work. And I, 
am really blown away by young folks who can do that in their 20s and put themselves out there when their professor and their peers are not prepared to engage in that helpful way. Because that can be harmful and that can like tear you down as a person. And so I like hats off to them and I wish I had that then, but instead I focus like learn the craft, protect yourself in this way, put yourself out in the terms that they can critique it. That was probably a long response, but I thought about no, that. So. Well <laughs> as the one of the professors. <laughs> I would just say you were one of the very few students in my mostly long experience who yep. you know totally embraced risk and resistance from, you know as a what, nineteen year old. Yeah. And and that in doing that, I mean these are these are great objects. But I think the meaning that you're talking about with them requires projection. Mm -hmm. But the process by which you made this is an internal space mm -hmm. yeah. that is developed through risk and resistance mm -hmm. of material. Yeah. And risk of failure and risk of lack of perfection. That <laughs> Man, you've created a lot of space but that makes amazing things. It's all these amazing things like that. And I just so. My experience was a little bit um, inverse. I was significantly more brave when I was younger. And I was the child, I was the only person of color in my classes. Um, and at 11 years old, I was put as a freshman in high school because I had tested in that space. And I was about to be put in a lower grade because they said I was not emotionally mature enough because I kept crying whenever we had to partner up and I didn't have a partner. I would cry. I still cry the jump of the hat. And I think that's just, I accepted that I'm not good at this point. Um, but what that made me do was got to the point where my teacher was teaching history, especially American history. I learned a completely different history back in West Africa and in the UK when we were growing up. So if you don't tell me American history and I learned a different version of that history, I would contradict them completely. Say, no, I'm sorry, that's not, that was not how that happened. But were you there? No, but this history seems a little bit different. And because I was so, I love my culture, I love traditional West African dance, but it became one of those things where anytime we have any showcase at school, I would do West African dance. But what I learned over time was that this bravery made me actually resentful to the environment I was in because whenever we had something related to African or black, I was the one that was pushed. Yeah. Now, as I mentioned, I don't have the full black experience as a black American in this country. So you're telling an 11 year old immigrant child to now stand and represent black American. Like that is a level that I do not have. So that actually caused me to swallow my identity a lot more so that I could then navigate through the world without being told, by the way, you're African, why don't you come into African dance for this one thing? Why don't you tell us about Kwanzaa? Kwanzaa is an American holiday, I know nothing about So that caused me to swallow that identity a lot more, to create art that I wanted from an outside perspective. And that has shifted now. So I went through that period of silence, so to speak, right? to now be in a place where I realize that what I want to do is no longer this intersection of my identity as well, my ethnic or my racial identity. What I want to do is create art that's based on how I feel and what story I want to tell. And if the story I want to tell intersects with my identity, then yes, I'm absolutely going to infuse it with that, right? But if it does not need to intersect with my identity as an African woman or as someone who has learned to become what it means to be black in America, then it's not it, right? And that comes in different ways. I've done art pieces that I strictly will only um, hire women for, and that's it, because I want to actually focus on the feminine gaze, right? I want to actually create dance that calls on the African deities of this or that, based on what I want to create. So what story do you want to tell, right? And everything else for me becomes kind of the what do you call when you decorate food at the end of it all? I don't know what's going on. What? That's not me. Um, oh, I love frosting. I was thinking, I'm like, I was thinking 
think of a savory dish. Garnish. 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 Yes, that's Garnish. the word. Garnish. Garnish. Everything else becomes a garnish, right? So the technique that I cook it in is still my identity. It's still connected to who I am as a person. But now I'm going to do art that actually brings me joy, that relates to what story I'm going to tell. Yeah. And everything else will fall into place mm -hmm. because why not? Yeah. yeah. I, I, and those are the places that I kind of get to. I mean, I'm, and I, I'm having this conversation with myself. It's just like, be true to your heart. Just say what you want to say. You know, speak, speak. But, but it is, it's, it's a conversation I often have. But also, like, fiber work that you're producing to, to be in discussion with other work that exists, the only reason we're talking about identity is because the default is white identity in the work. So, like... Is that... It becomes this thing of like you just work, make work about who you are, about how you want to be in the world, about the process of making, about whatever it is, and that helps to shape the definition of that field or that sector, right? Because right now the default is white, and the voices of folks of color are not integral to what we think of as that work, and that's more of the issue. That individually we're not shape, we're not doing that, but together as we produce work about whatever we want to, we should, what is discussed. Yeah. You yes. know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, I feel it. And I feel, and I feel what, you, what you're saying. It's just, it's a process. This is like a journey. Thank you. Yeah. I would love to see some Yeah. Happy to share. <laughs> Any other comments, that? No, that just right. makes me think of, I was going to writing about three M's. Uh, matter, material, and medium. And, um, you know, matter is just kind of chaos. Material, we can put material to format. Mm -hmm. and, and it becomes a medium that, that individual experiences communicate. Mm -hmm. so, and, that, and I think there's, and that's all in, again, it's all in, it happens in process. Mm -hmm. Kind of confronting um, the edge all the way through, mm -hmm. and the medium, you know, the medium can get stuck, um, and there are a lot of presumptions. You know, particularly our medium, it was like, <laughs> mm -hmm. thankfully, not as one of the folks who's not sticking it, but as a kind of pretty, yeah, but um, um, yeah, so. So that's, but it's that continuum that's really important. And I think it's really, you know, really important to go back to the nature of the material that we work with and how we, and how we personally confront it. And the, well, my point is, that is a stage from which identity is built, not mm -hmm. projected. You know, and I'm, after 50 years, I'm still trying to construct my identity. Mm -hmm. I do it every day in the first place. That's the point of view of a very serious solipsist. Any other questions or thoughts? Something that's perfect, the side of the of God, 
what can be defined as perfect. So you take your piece and you make things like that, obviously. Intentionally, you do it from puzzle, you intentionally make it. Did I intentionally took pieces and you make them all and try to make your own better? Did I intentionally okay, can you connect <laughs> your work being the fact that you have all these pieces, your wood is not a single entity. Yeah, you have yeah. All these put them back together. Was that an intentionality around putting all these pieces together to create a whole? And relating that to just how hmm. the US is with yeah. uh, well, this, you know, everyone is completely perfect. Yeah, I think I understand the question. I think I understand the context of the question and the question. Um, and I'll, so I haven't put words to it like that before, um, but I'll say I made a chair in school and, um, there's the, like, you know, I made it out of walnut. Remember that chair? It's out of walnut. And there's parts of the wood that you get that are, what is it called? It's like that light, light piece that you would cut off, like in, in a slab of, sapwood. thank you, sapwood. So you get the, like variation of the wood and there's a piece that you would typically like cut off and not include in it. It's much lighter than the rest of the wood. And that chair, I was like, why am I going to cut that piece off? Like, why would I leave that out? That's part of the, the lumber, the part of the tree. And people were like, well, that's, that's not traditional. Like, that's not what you would normally do. You would cut it out and it would be kind of more pristine, really, right? Like you would kind of shave off the pieces that don't quite look the same. You would think about the matching of the, um, grain of the wood and how you want that to fold over your the furniture that you create. And I was like, whatever, I'm just going to like mill it all up, cut it all up into the pieces I need, and it'll go together the way it goes together. And then that chair, there's a piece of that sap wood on the side. Um, and I remember, like, I think it bothered some people, and it didn't bother me. Like, it was like, that was part of it. And so I haven't put words to it like that. Um, this idea of like these pieces are all coming together and I'm intentional, I think, in how I bring them together to then cut them apart to build the vessels. And I get the lumber, mill it, and put it together in any which way because at that point it doesn't matter to the process. I'm just, like the color, the variation, it's, it's kind of like randomly, in my mind, it's like I'm randomly putting them together, gluing it back up, kind of milling it all again, to then have this block that I cut apart and then try to build it into something that is not perfect, but maybe I think of it as. But the original kind of configuration, it is what it is. Those are all different pieces of different parts of the wood or, you know, of the lumber that they gave me. Um, and in this one, I actually felt the, I probably should have thought about it more because each piece had different moisture content. And as you built it, <laughs> they pushed against each other in different ways, and they dried out at different rates. And I felt the fibers trying to pull apart at moments. So I just think about that. And, um, but I, you know, I, I didn't. I don't think about it at the early stage of that configuration. It's more like this is what the trees were given us, and I'm going to use it almost all of it. As much as I can, and it's kind of like a like it is what it is when it comes together, you know. So I don't know. Mm. That, that reminds me of a conversation that I had with Sid Carpenter, um, yes. a ceramic yes. artist here in Philly, um, who, who well, visited the show, was really excited about the idea of that and uses that concept. A lot in her work to talk about all the things we've been talking about today. And by the way, if I forget to say this later, thank you both of you for creating a conversation that hits on me with these three themes of embodiment, autonomy, and ornament um, so profoundly that I, I'll be walking out of this place thinking so, beyond what I even thought as I was creating you know, research for this space that we're sitting in now. But one of the things that Sid said that really helped me understand your world was that um, everything that happens to our body is a vessel happens on the, in the interior of it. Mm. And you know, sometimes things like pregnancy or cancer mm -hmm. um, 
make an impact on the outside of us. So we can call that one of them. We can call that a number of different things. But it starts on the inside. And so seeing the roughness, mm -hmm. um, and you and I have talked about that a little, and you've also been really open. I think you're quoting a number of places talking about how you know that roughness is, is sort of what happens when you bear a child. Things get torn apart and then put back together. Mm -hmm. And um, but I'm trying to reconcile that with your earlier um, mention of when you were a child trying to find safe spaces. Mm -hmm. You're creating now vessels that that feel safe on the outside mm -hmm. in terms of the conventional ways that we think of safety, like smooth mm -hmm. and undisruptive. And then on the inside, we have these jagged edges. Mm -hmm. So how how do you like I, I don't know if that's a conflict or if that's something you've thought about, but as a curator I have to ask you that question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's my job to do that. Mm -hmm. I thought, yeah, I thought about that um, some and again like these are work in progress, right? Like each piece that you make, you're kind of like thinking about it as you make it and it lands somewhere and the next time you make a piece it'll land somewhere else. And so I paint the insides of these with milk paint. And I really like milk paint because you can sand it. And these, are, you can kind of see it in the large one, in, in maybe that um, kind of light blue one. It gets really smooth but still textured. And some of them are very, very rough, and some of them are smoother. Um, and again, like I think through. The making so like the words aren't necessarily there but I'm like in it in my mind like it's like an embodiment practice as I'm producing these pieces um, and so I've kind of been grappling with you're right that these are rough and I don't love the roughness like I would love it to be smooth if I could figure it out and, and smooth it out I might consider it like I because I, I'm tempted to because I really like that pristine exterior right so internally I feel this tension in as I'm making these pieces, and then I see attention <laughs> <laughs> as my child. Um, but I, but in the milk paint process, it takes like the interior to me. It takes it and smooths it out. You still get some of that roughness, but it smooths out and it feels inviting with the milk paint. It feels inviting, like you want to touch it, like you want to kind of be in there. Mm -hmm. it, it, it visually it um, it changes it. That instead of that roughness that kind of pushes you away, it is more inviting. It's not as evident. It's not evident in this one as much, but the key is when you start to see that glisten, it become it's like changing the. Sorry, I didn't forgot that I was recorded. Um, it changes the texture of it. So it's something I'm grappling with because I'm like, to me, that big one feels protective. And this one, this one over here feels protective. And there's like a thickness like that, but that belly. It's like the belly of this is very thin. Sorry, I'm actually, it's like very thin. And that feels more protective. And these feel more vulnerable. And these are rougher in there. Mm. Um, and this one, there's not even an opening. So, like, what's that's extremely protective. But you can't get in, you can't put anything in there. Mm. Yes. It's also metaphorically, maybe it's like a movie. Yeah, it's like, it was one of the last ones made. Yeah. One of the last ones to start get started and to finish, you know. Um, and so, yeah, there's no, like, I don't, in words, I don't have an endpoint or a solution to it. But I think I, I'm thinking about those things as I, as I make those pieces. Um, and some of them, like the walnut vessel I made a long time ago, that piece is pretty smooth on the inside. It's not as smooth as the outside, but it's pretty smooth. And it feels like it could kind of curl in there. Um, and then I started thinking, like, how do we make these bigger, like, like huge oh. vessels? Do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the, like, softness of something that feels almost, like, cushiony. Mm. But it's not. It's hard. Mm. 
Yeah, it's deceiving. So, so um, that makes me want to ask for the next slide. Or, sorry, I shouldn't be done, but are there problems that came up with this, or you know, issues that came up with this work, which will um, sort of, you know, uh, direct your next body of work? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're talking about them right now. Scale, texture, and it's formal. You know, it's all formal. Yeah. So I have a show in May that I have to make something for, and it's specifically about the unadulterated black joy. I have no idea what I'm going to make for that. <laughs> like, so I'm kind of grappling with, like, how do these public practices, community-based practice intersect with my wood practice in a tangible way that shows up in a gallery. You know, like, this is one way, but like how, how do I do that and what, what comes next? Um, so I'm thinking a lot about, and I do, in my other work that's not here, I do bent lamination. Um, but I'm thinking about doing some bending in some capacity, like being able to draw in three dimensions. Like, I've, I don't know what that's going to look like, but like, how do I do that through wood? How do I do that through bending, through um, bending over, like, the bending irons? I'm like, how do I start to like, play with with linear forms that become three-dimensional? So that's, like, a thought. Um, I don't, and I have a show in September that's a solo show in Boston that I am, like, really excited about. But I am, I do not know. I don't know what's next. I need to, like, be in the the studio and just like <laughs> yeah. yeah and like make and fail for a bit which I am terrified about <laughs> so you know it's like unsatisfying to me to not have a plan because I'm like a 10 year planner <laughs> but to not have a plan of what's going to be an exhibition of like is it going to be performed is it going to be shell like forms is it going to be vessel like forms those are, those are connected like I don't know that's unsettling. Kind of I need to play more. Yeah, mm -hmm. I do. Have some fun. In the in the studio. Studio. Exactly. Yeah. In the yeah. Any last anything? That's pretty good timing, y'all. Okay. So, I don't know what the gender experience is in school. Is it the kind of thing that you Can you repeat the question one more time? A little louder. So I was asking, how did your relationship with creating, with presenting your identity to your art? Because I think you said you were a little more restrictive in terms of your identity. Yeah. So they created some kind of resentment for your environment. So how did that affect your joy related to your art practice, and how did you try to work through that? Do you want me to go first? <laughs> um, so I found that I stopped doing anything that related to traditional West African dance or culture at school or anything in New Hampshire at all. Um, what ended up happening was that I then pivoted completely and utterly into learning about Shakespeare. I entered theater. <laughs> That's what I did. Um, and in the theater program, I met this incredible, incredible director named Deborah Tover. And um, she had a summer program in Boston. And she basically was like, yes, you're going to do this program. I was like, I can't. She's like, you're doing this program. Mm -hmm. So I did the program with her. And every summer, I would spend time in Boston, taking the bus from Miami to Boston. And in that process, I realized, oh my goodness, Boston has black people. <laughs> That's incredible. So then I started looking up where dance happened in Boston. And I found that dance happened at a singular place in Cambridge. Um, not just any dance, but traditional dances, folk dances, ethnic dances, happened at a place called the Dance Complex in Cambridge. And so I started going to the Dance Complex. And there, I eventually was brave enough to audition for a West African dance company that was made up of people that looked like me. And that was where I found my community again. And from that point on, my focus was less on what else the external perspective of my work was, and more about my own enjoyment in that space, and my own connectivity, and my own community. So 
Once I entered that space and I was actively in the West African dance community in Boston, I found my tribe to a certain extent. And unfortunately, people of that tribe, especially the person who was a pillar for me in that tribe, passed away. And so that kind of created a place where I did step into more of this isolation space once my child was born. Um, but that experience of realizing that my art blossomed once I had my community around. Right? I no longer have to worry about what the external perspective of what my art looks like. I'm going to create because it gives me joy. And I'm also quite aware because my mom being a family mom is like, you're going to be a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer. I'm neither. I'm none of those things, right? But she reminded me that in order for me to continue doing what I love and enjoy as my art, I needed to make sure I had some financial stability around. So I was constantly balancing how much of my art I was doing for money and how much of my art I was doing for myself. To the point where once I actually got out of college, I made a decision to go to college with something that had nothing to do with my art. And once I got out of college, I realized that I actually enjoyed having my art for myself. Mm -hmm. Because I could put on any production I want, whenever I wanted, and no one could dictate what it's supposed to look like except for myself. Right? And so that's where my shift happened for me. It's once I stopped caring about, once I could dictate the terms of how my heart was being created and was being produced, once I had ownership of my own heart, that was when I felt the most. So I felt my groove. That's really where I am right Well, except my, I currently have two bosses that are tiny humans. So, yeah, there's that part. <laughs> yeah. And I'll say, like, I'm an artist, and, I, and I'm a craftsperson. Like, I identify. I think some people don't. Like, I would call them crafts people, but they don't necessarily identify as such. And to me, what that means is I actually really enjoy the process of making. Like, that's how I kind of, that's why I kind of fully root myself into it as a craftsperson. So, like, these pieces, we talk about vessels and what vessels mean in our lives, um, and why I make these pieces as I make them is I enjoy the process of it. I enjoy being on the manza. I enjoy cutting them a certain way, numbering them all, figuring it out. I enjoy um, the the glue up process and like they're just like that part of it. Doing something repetitively um, in the shop for hours. The problem solving I do really like and get frustrated by when <laughs> woodworking, um, but I, I like fully identify. And I remember that in school, if, like I switched from graphic design to furniture design, and I remember the moment where they were teaching me how to plane a board or something, and then like give the carbon egg, and I was like, oh yeah, I can do this all day, every day, regardless of anything else happening. I like the mortise antenna joints, and they popped, and I was like, ah, <laughs> like. I'm good at this, and I like this. So like, it's joyful. <coughs> I listen to music, and I just go into my space and like make. And so, um, to find my joy, I that being in the shop is that for me. Um, it's part of my like my joy as a as a human. Um, and there's other aspects. The rest of outside of the shop life, it's like to be. How do you bring that joy back when it, when it Kind of society pulls it away, but in in the shop, that's a joyous space. Um, and so, like I, in school, I just made, I just made, and like I'd sit on the table, I'd like claim a table saw all day, and it was it felt good, you know. So, yeah. It's like two. to think with you um, and to follow your path. Thank you for holding our hands as we think much deeper about vessels. 
Oh, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for being a part of this show and creating enormously beautiful and inspiring works for everyone. Thank you for having us.